The dreadful and famous Pablo Escobar wasn't just wicked and brutal, he got the DNA imprinted inside of him, not only as a young boy, but through his immediate predecessor as a drug lord. There is a saying that, what a man can do, a woman can do better. Pablo Escobar's immediate boss, Griselda Blanco, was popularly known as the true patroness of evil. She was the queenpin among the kingpins of the Medellin cocaine cartel in Colombia throughout the 1970s and 1980s. If you are really interested in this hot gist, stick around to the end of this video as we unveil the queenpin's reign as a godmother and the relationship with Pablo Escobar. Who is Griselda Blanco? Griselda Blanco was a trailblazer for female entrepreneurs around the world, but for all the wrong reasons as she spearheaded a nearly unrivaled campaign of violence. The three times married mother of four, who was Pablo Escobar's predecessor and adversary, had a Malibu mansion, a bronze sculpture of herself, a tea set previously owned by the queen, and an emerald encrusted gold-plated submachine gun. She reportedly made 60 million pounds a month at her peak with an estimated 1.5 billion pounds fortune as a result per annum, making her the first female drug lord billionaire. Her success was largely due to her appetite for murder, the bloodier, the better. She was born in 1943 and began her criminal career at a very young age. When she was just 11 years old, she was accused of kidnapping a 10-year-old boy, killing him after his parents refused to pay a ransom, and then shooting herself. Blanco was soon forced to leave Cartanenga and live on the streets of Medellin after experiencing severe violence at home. There, she made a living by pickpocketing and selling her body. When Blanco met and eventually married Carlos Trujillo, a smuggler of unauthorized immigrants into the United States, at the age of 13, she had her first taste of turning crime into a lucrative business. Despite having three boys together, their marriage was short-lived. Trujillo would subsequently be assassinated by Blanco in the 1970s. He was the first of her three husbands to suffer a violent demise. Griselda Blanco was exposed to the cocaine trade by Alberto Bravo, her second husband. They relocated to Queens, New York in the early 1970s, where their business took off. They had a direct path to the white powder in Colombia, which significantly reduced the Italian mafia's profits. At this point, Blanco earned the nickname The Godmother. She devised a cunning plan to bring cocaine into New York. Young ladies were forced to board airplanes while carrying cocaine concealed in bras and underwear that Blanco had made specifically for the purpose. Bravo returned to Colombia to reorganize the export end, since the business was expanding. In the meantime, Blanco grew her empire in New York, but everything broke down in 1975. Operation Banshee, the largest at the time, was a combination NYPD DEA sting operation that caught Blanco and Bravo. However, Blanco was able to get away and travel to Colombia before she could get charged. She is accused of killing Bravo there in a shootout over stolen millions. Bravo is said to have found a round from his Uzi into Blanco's stomach as she retrieved a pistol from her boots and shot him in the face. Others, however, think that her husband's murder was committed by Pablo Escobar. Griselda Blanco's autopsy would subsequently show that she did, in fact, have a bullet scar on her torso, regardless of which account is accurate. The biggest at the time was Operation Banshee, a joint NYPD DEA sting. The Queenpin Among the Kingpins. Griselda Blanco acquired a new nickname after the passing of her second husband, the Black Widow. Her drug enterprise was now entirely under her control. Even after the bust, Blanco continued to operate her operation out of Colombia and send cocaine to the United States. In 1976, Blanco is accused of smuggling cocaine on board the Gloria, a ship that the Colombian government brought to the United States for a race commemorating the country's bicentennial in New York Harbor. She wed Dario Sepulveda, a bank robber, as her third spouse in 1978. Her fourth child, Michael Corleone, was born in the same year. She presumably thought it was appropriate to name her son after the character played by Al Pacino in The Godfather. Michael Corleone. Because she had taken on the role of godmother herself. 
The Queen of Cocaine would subsequently become well known as she set her sights on Miami. Blanco, a forerunner in the Miami-based cocaine trafficking, used her outstanding commercial acumen to spread the drug to as many people as she could. And it was profitable for a while. She had a wealthy lifestyle in Miami. She has everything, mansions, pricey cars, and a private jet. There were no restrictions. She also held crazy parties that were frequented by all the key figures in the drug industry. However, just because she was enjoying her newfound fortune did not imply her aggressive behavior had ended. She allegedly used a gun to coerce both men and women into having sex with her. Blanco also developed a dependence on smoking massive quantities of bazooka, an unrefined form of cocaine. This probably fueled her growing paranoia. She did, however, live in a perilous environment. The Medellin cartel, which at the time was bringing plane loads of cocaine into Miami, was one of the factions that were facing rising rivalry. Conflict broke out shortly. South Florida was turned into a war zone between 1979 and 1984. On July 11, 1979, the first bullets were fired. A rival drug dealer was murdered by several of Blanco's hitmen at the Crown Liquor Outlet in the Dadeland Shopping Mall. Though the police interfered, this wasn't the end of it all. Miami recorded 75 homicides in the first five months of 1980. There were 169 throughout the previous seven months. And by 1981, Miami had become not just the world's and America's capital of murder. The majority of the city's homicides occurred during the era's cocaine cowboy drug warfare, in which Colombia and Cuban dealers frequently murdered one another with submachine guns. However, this period might not have been quite as painful if it weren't for Blanco. Many people, including her fellow drug lords, were terrified of Blanco. Other offenders killed with intent, said one expert. Before they killed, they would make sure. Blanco would murder first, then claim that the victim was innocent. It's too unfortunate, but he's passed away now. Then, in the latter part of 1983, Blanco's third spouse was under attack. Michael Corleone was abducted by Sepulveda and taken back to Colombia with her, but he was caught by La Madrina. As her shocked kid looked on, she allegedly hired hitmen to shoot him to death. She might have been able to get her kid back, but Paco and Sepulveda's conflict broke out shortly after Sepulveda's murder. Blanco regarded it as only a challenge to be overcome. But soon, some of Blanco's erstwhile allies, including a crucial supplier, decided to support Paco. The queen pin is gradually meeting her end. Her brutality and wickedness have gotten her so many enemies waiting for a chance to take her out that way. At the peak of her power in the 1980s, she controlled a billion dollar network that sent 3,400 pounds of cocaine into the United States each month. Unfortunately, her terrible past was fast catching up with her. Her deceased second husband's nephew, Jaime, kept watch in her favorite shopping centers in 1984, waiting for his time to murder her. Despite the number of people waiting to take revenge on her, she increased the bloodshed by ordering the murder of Marta Sagriaga Ochoa, a drug supplier. The $1.8 million Blanco owed her new source was money she did not want to pay. Thus, Ochoa's body was discovered in a canal at the beginning of 1984. In the meantime, La Madrina continued to be the target of both the DEA and her expanding list of foes. Early in 1984, Blanco decided to relocate to California since the heat had become intolerable. She was able to hide out there and elude both Bravo's nephew and the DEA. But by November, Bravo's nephew had been detained because the DEA might have been able to catch Blanco without him. After the nephew was removed from the situation, the DEA was able to approach Blanco. At the age of 42, she was also detained in 1985. She ultimately received a nearly 20-year prison term for distributing drugs. While in prison, her adversaries focused on her son, Esvaldo, one of Pablo Escobar's men shot Esvaldo in the leg and shoulder in 1992, and Esvaldo later bled to death in the hospital. The big setback for Blanco, however, came in 1994, when her go-to hitman, Ayala, was named the key witness in a case where she was accused of murder. The godmother reportedly had a nervous breakdown as a result of this. Ayala had enough evidence against her to repeatedly sentence her to death by electric chair. 
However, she was smart enough to escape, being put on death row as Ayla was later removed as a key witness for some reasons. She was later released and sent back to California after accepting a plea bargain in 2004. But despite her lucky break, she had already amassed too many enemies to be warmly welcomed home at that point. Griselda Blanco, 69, suffered a terrible death in 2012. Blanco was killed in a motorbike drive-by shooting outside a butcher shop in Medellin, Colombia, using the same assassination technique she had invented years before. Who killed her is still a mystery. Was this a resentful former friend or associate of Pablo Escobar's? Or perhaps a furious relative of a person she killed? It is hard to tell who Blanco's adversaries were because she had so many. According to the book's author, Drug Trafficking in the Americas, Bruce Bagley, it's some sort of poetic justice that she met an end that she handed to so many others. She might have repented from her terrible past, but she had amassed enough enemies scattered everywhere. Definitely, what goes around comes around. Trust you find every bit of this information interesting. We promise to give more riveting content. Thanks for watching.